So when you were initially just hustling, like selling CDs, were you, were you doing shows at the Middle East? Were you at the Great Scott, bro? Because, I mean, you know there's like a collection. Yeah, well, that's, that's another thing. Like around, I was banned from the Middle East before I even got to, with some, <laughs> some of the first dudes to ever beat dudes up on Worldstar, ever. You can check the files. You know what I mean? Like you, you bagged a dude outside the Middle East. My first show at the no in the Middle East. My first show <laughs> at the Middle East, and it was on camera. I don't know. Some dude came doing some dude from Boston doing some retarded shit, and we hopped off and and you know we gave him the T Rex arms. Like he was so he was dead, but he he came back to life. You know what I mean? You're but, downstairs. Um, yeah, downstairs. And so Leeds didn't fuck with me at all from that. So like, you know, Leeds is the is the gatekeeper over there. And um, but I was so young, I thought like that was the point of hip hop. Like we rapping this shit, what you think we're gonna do? But I didn't understand that you have to separate it out of the professionalism. But yeah, we laid this dude out and I was banned from the Middle East until probably 2013. So shows were like out the window. I was banned from all the clubs. I was banned from the clubs early. Like I've been, I was blackballed from Boston. I repaired my image with, um, you know, like politically slowly starting to pop up at Celtics games with the right people, have these meetings with the right people, shit like that. Like it took a while because dudes looked at me like a real um, knucklehead because of, you know, everywhere we went, it, it was something, it was something happening, you know? Hi, my name is Millie's and this is my golden hour. Boston. 2020, an era of chaos, but one podcast perseveres to unite the city. (laughs) Yes, sir, baby boy, it's Big Bochy, and you're now tuned into the number one podcast in Boston. Season six is booming. It's hot in the city today, bro. So I like it. And I, w- I was in Central Square like yesterday, and it was like a, a zombie apocalypse. It was insane. What, like crackheads and shit? No, well, there was just no one out, dude. It was just like totally vacant. Oh, oh, with like Harvard it, Square. It was vacant. Yeah, that's crazy. That I, well, hey, man, I, I got my producers on the phone. Slugs, B, and Lexi, say what's up to Millie's. Hi, how are you? What's up, Slugs, B, and Lexi? Hey, man, so listen, when I had started the show way back, this was always a goal. I was like, yo, bro, if I get Millie's on the show, dog, that'd be, I know I'm doing something right if I make that happen. So thank out, you. I've been seeing your show for a minute. Thank you for making this happen, bro. I appreciate you. Nah, it's nothing. Turn that down, please. So we, uh, before we move on, can you just give a quick synopsis of who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, I'm Millie's. Some people call me Blanco. I do high-level rap, not high-level rap. I do all type of music, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm an artist, Massachusetts based. And so you said something once, I think it was on Twitter, because I think you, you probably got the best Twitter in the city, bro. <laughs> you said something, you were like, I don't think there's anything more difficult than be, being a white rapper out of Boston, Massachusetts and being successful. You think that's true? I think the quote was... I think I originally just said one of the hardest things to do in the world is make it out of Massachusetts as a rapper. The white rapper adds an extra layer to it. The white rapper, that's kind, it's kind of two different things because, yes, yeah, statistically and realistically, one of the hardest things to do is make it out of Massachusetts as an artist. Just look at the stats. Like, you know, I live three hours away in New York and probably in the last 20 years, at least 1,500 artists have got a record deal over the last 20 years in New York. In Boston, the whole Massachusetts, maybe six. So you're looking at like six versus 1,500, three hours away. So obviously there's something fundamentally wrong. The white artist part, I think it's harder as a white rapper to make it, but once you make it, that white privilege kicks in and then you, you blow up bigger than bigger than life you know what i mean it's just hard to actually get to that point wait so you think the way your career has worked is like once you had the platform being white actually helped no 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 no. because i'm not on yet i'm still like <laughs> i like that let's go bro yeah I'm, I'm still underground i mean more like um i mean more like like when you get to like g-easy notor- notoriety 
then it's easy because these brands and these court, you're more corporately say, you know, it's white privilege. Fucking Target is going to work with you or whatever, shit like that. But up to that point, when you're still underground, it's hard. You know what I mean? Um, just because, you know, the stigma that it comes with it and shit like that. Absolutely. Before we move on, yo, happy birthday, C's. Thanks for making this happen, bro. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. Did you guys celebrate? Nah, hell no, not really. It's quarantine. <laughs> Dead ass, dude. I was going to say... Strip club or something. I was going to say, you're probably statistically more likely to catch the COVID than make it out of Massachusetts as an artist, bro. That's a fact. Hell yeah, definitely. Um, so I think, I mean, you've done a million interviews. I think one thing that people can really benefit from this, bro, and, and me personally, is like just hearing how you actually built a, a brand, a prevalent brand using your resources in Boston. Cause like, dude, it's, I mean, I've thrown shows at the middle East, bro. I started just having an artist on the show. I know that it doesn't happen. So can, can you just like start way back? Like when you made the decision, like, all right, yo, I'm actually going to do this. And I'm, I'm going to actually glow up. Um, yeah. So I probably started like, <clears throat> trying to rap around 2008 even maybe like a little before but like 2008 I, I dropped a mixtape called white boy like me um it was probably i don't i don't remember how many songs but it, it was a good amount of songs um and i was passionate about it we we shot the uh i was branding before i knew what branding was because i always been like the only white kid in my neighborhood for real there's a couple others but Really, I don't, you know, it, it's very slim. And um, so I, I had the concept for White Boy Like Me and, and, and I called dudes around the neighborhood and I was like, yo, I want to do a photo shoot for my album cover. And I got probably like a quarter of my neighborhood to come out. Of the, my neighborhood was pip. Cambridge was lit before gentrification. Like my neighborhood was deep. But really, I, the port? I, nah, the coast. So I probably pulled out like 50 dudes or whatever. And, and, and at the time there was a store called Boss Town and shit. They sold like white t-shirts, black t-shirts, shit like that, $5. Everybody went and got a black tee and I got a white tee. And I just stood in front of like my whole neighborhood. And I had the white boy with the white tee and mad black dudes behind me with black tees. And, and we called it white boy like me. And um, at the time, I think it was like MySpace out. Um, Whoa, it's a throwback, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Way back. Yeah, so I'm like, I think I'm, I think I'm like 18 or some shit like that. And we started, we started pushing uh, the CDs. We started pushing the CDs everywhere. Like we would go, like one of my shits was I would go downtown and, and I would stop my car in the theater district after the club let out. It's like I would stop my car, wherever you were trying to go, it was over. I'm stopping my shit right in front of you. And so I would, I would cause like little traffic pileups and I'd hop out of my car and I'd walk to everybody's shit. If you look like you were into hip hop, I'd give you a CD. So it was like super guerrilla marketing and we did it everywhere. We used to spend like summers out in like Harlem on our 149th between 7th and 8th and, and pass out wild CDs. We used to go to, um, what's that beach in New Hampshire? Um, Seabrook? I think Hampton Beach, yeah. Hampton oh, Hampton. Beach. Around like when they shoot the fireworks off, Fourth of July or whatever, pass CDs out. Like, oh, my CD grind was crazy. Like, I'm not, I've, I've never been scared to like, uh, you know, approach people and try to promote myself. So that kind of gave me like, like a little buzz. And then, um, well, dude, who was doing it in 2008? I mean, because Melfi was like 2011, right? Like that came later. It was like, it was like, um, Smoke Bulger, um, Frankie Wainwright, um. Terminology, slain. Um, there was no Phoenix down at this time either, right? Nah, nah, no, no, no. So, yeah, that was like the early stages. But then I was, I was rapping and I was going hard. But at the same time, I was caught up in other shit too. So, for like five years after that, I still really wasn't taking it serious, serious, until about 2013, when I, when I just kind of um decided to try to go all in as an artist and um yeah did was in 2013 was there like a did you reach like a low point was it like a clicking moment where like yo bro it's like this or nothing like i'm gonna burn all the bridges behind me um yeah a, a lot well in like 2011 um 
I had a I had a release party uh for one of my songs or my album, something like that. And um I went outside of the release party and my man um Rock Ducati, who was a big influence on 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 my life, um, he actually uh he got killed in the theater district. Um and that and that was like a big kind of like dark cloud just over my career because I went from doing something so positive to the most negative experience, you know what I mean? And so um that kind of fucked me up because I'm like, damn, I'm chasing this music shit. And 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 everything is spoke, and that's what's supposed to be positive, you know what I mean? Because I really got a street background, like really was into a lot of things. And and it blew my mind that that the streets could follow me to this rap shit. Now you see it all the time. But at, at that time, I was thinking like those, those two things could be separate. But yeah, after Rock, you know, after Rock died, I kind of just felt this this dark cloud over me. And I didn't really know how to move with the music. I started trying out like different, like I even did an EDM type record. Oh, is that, does and, someone and still have that? It's around somewhere. <laughs> anything I could kind of like, I, I try to make like more commercial music because I wanted to do anything at that time I could to get the fuck out of my predicament, to get some money, to help the people around me because we were really going through it, you know what I mean? Um, after that kind of storm blew over, I kind of reinvented myself around, you know, 2013, 14. 2013, I started working with this group called the Colombians from Medellin, Colombia. And they would send me beats and we actually ended up, you know, having them come over here. And I went out to Medellin and we just, we, we kind of like started the brand, the brand from the ground up. You know what I mean? I went back to my roots as the white boy like me type shit. And I've been pushing ever since then. Like that was kind of the, the it was a restart. It was a dark period. Definitely. Um, so like I've been rapping since 2008, but I, I can't really say I was rapping, rapping until 2013. You know what I mean? Did you know like you were crazy when you started? <laughs> and I mean that in like the most positive sense. Cause bro, like you sent it when there was no model for you. Like you just had to go. There was no one else had done it in the city really. I mean, cause I know Stiz was coming up like 2015, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met Stiz around the same time that I was kind of, you know, reinventing myself too, musically and shit. I met Stiz real early. So did you... So you've always thought since the start, you're like, yo, I know I can make this happen. I just don't know how long yeah, it's going to take. because I'm nice. You know what I mean? I always knew I was nice. I've had enough validation my whole life. You know, like my whole life since the beginning, as far as rapping, I always had enough validation. Like I always would be the center of attention if it was a cypher or people rapping or, or putting a song out. I just knew, you know what I mean? Like the music was never a question. My talent was never a question. It was everything else, you know? When you had started, were you, were you patient? Nah, I wanted to just get on as soon as I started. Uh, bro, I feel you sometimes, dog. I just have no patience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to get on. Now, like I, I got like marathon. I also, I'm also a, a student of, you know, Nipsey and his, his marathon teachings, you dig? So I really, um, I, I got into Nipsey around 2012, heavy, and he was, um, you know, marathoned out, man. And uh, I started adopting that philosophy because my career has always been kind of just like a steady incline. You know, at, for, since 2013, it's not, I never feel like I'm rolling back. It's always going, it's just not taking those super, Leaps like I'd like it to, but it's all right because I'm still, you know, get to where I'm going just a little slower. What's a super a super leap for you? Like you want a big commercial record or a big billboard record? Yeah, 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 yeah. I would say like like commercial success. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, my man, like, so geek just got on Drake's album, like. I didn't hear him until I heard Atlantis, bro. And then I, I saw it on the tape. I was like, oh, shit, that's crazy. Yeah, so, like, you know, like a moment like that, I got so much groundwork that, like, a moment like that would take me over. You know, but um, whether or not that comes, I'll just keep building my structure. And... So when you were initially just hustling, like, selling CDs, were you, were you doing shows at the Middle East? Were you at the Great Scott, bro? Because, I mean, you know there's, like, a collection yeah, well, that's of... That's another thing, like around 
I was banned from the Middle East before I even got to where some of the <laughs> where some of the first dudes to ever beat dudes up on World Star ever. You can check the files. You know what I mean? Like oh, you you bagged a dude outside the Middle East. My first show at the no in the Middle East. My first show <laughs> at the Middle East, and it was on camera. I don't know. Some dude came doing some dude from Boston doing some retarded shit, and we hopped off and and you know we gave him the T Rex arms. Like he was so he was dead, but he he came back to life. You know what I mean? You but, downstairs. Um, yeah, downstairs. And so Leeds didn't fuck with me at all from that. So like you know, Leeds is the is the gatekeeper over there. And um, but I was so young, I thought like that was the point of hip hop. Like we rapping this shit. What you think we're gonna do? But I didn't understand that you have to separate it out of the professionalism. But yeah, we laid this dude out, and I was banned from the Middle East until probably 2013. So shows were like out the window. I was banned from all the clubs. I was banned from the clubs early. Like I've been, I was blackballed from Boston. I repaired my image with, um, you know, like politically slowly starting to pop up at Celtics games with the right people, have these meetings with the right people, shit like that. Like it took a while because dudes looked at me like a real um, knucklehead because of, you know, everywhere we went, it, it was something, it was something happening, you know? Now what were the popping clubs on Tremont back then? Was the Icon and Cure were still there? Probably, I mean, I was, I was kicked out, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was a huge shootout after after my one event in 2011. So I, I was banned until they started booking me in 2017, you know what I mean? And so, I mean, obviously this is like a question that tons of Boston artists ask all the time. Like, do you feel like you have to leave Boston to make it? Like, do you, do you think you needed the validation with some like the big bumps? And then you came back and you're like, all right, now people are showing mad love or you kind of already had the base. No, I had the base. I definitely had the base. I think you have to get the base and then you have to leave. You know what I mean? I think you have to get the base and then you have, to, and don't get confused on what the base is. You dig? Like a lot of dudes get confused. They think they have the base. You have to go outside of your circle. Pete, you, it, it's not a fan if they know you or know someone who knows you or know someone who knows someone who knows you. You dig? Like, that's not a fan. Like, that is an acquaintance of yours or some. You dig? Like, people get that shit confused. Like, nah, until it's... Like, I had it at least when I went to New York to where people ran to people hopping up. Yo, let me get an autograph. Shit like that. Like, I had a little base. And then I left. I think some people skip over that base. But once you do get the base... Which a lot, it's definitely out there because people support in Massachusetts. You dig? But you have to leave after that. You got to go. You got to go. You got to shake. You got to, because the biggest person you could fuck with out here is like Pup Dog. You know what I mean? That's the pinnacle. Once Pup Dog's fucking with you in radio, what's next? You got to go find the next connections. You dig? Like, even if you look at Mass right now, who got big social media followers? Like, who's lit on Instagram or like Twitter, like big numbers that could post you and your shit goes? We don't have a lot of that. You have to go out of town, build relationships, get your music in front of people and hope that's how my, it's the only way my Instagram got to like 100K because being out of town, People said, oh, y'all, you fire. Yo, send me that video you did. Send me that freestyle you did. All right, bet, bro. Sent it. I've been in so many functions when people see, like, I might go up 10,000 Instagram followers in a day because I'm in this party with fucking Casanova or whoever. It's like, yo, send me that thing. You know what I mean? I'm airdropping shit. People are putting me up. But it's grinding footwork, and you're not going to find that in Boston. Like, if you find it in Boston... You better hope to get on like joiner shit or be a shit or, and you know, that's hard to do, but there's these different places, LA, New York, you know, you could even, even if you're not moving, you could go to, go to every all-star weekend, go to every BET awards, go to all of that shit. That's what I was doing too. You know? Do you think it will always be that way? Or like do you, I mean, I think you do a lot in terms of giving back to everybody out here, but like, Let's say like 10 years, you're on some like real Mark Cuban CEO talk, right? Like you come back, you're like, all right, I'm gonna give back to the city, bro. I got it. Could you build a foundation here where Boston becomes a music city where it's like serious? 
the year Boston, I, I Boston think, slash Massachusetts. That's what people don't understand. It's gonna take a lot of artists lit at one time. Because now how social media is and how easy it is to kind of give somebody some notoriety. Let's say there's 10 artists that's lit out here. Five that's super duper lit, like um, like even take like a like RP, like a pop smoke, Fabio Foreign. And then you got like your French Montanas and these level people, let's say you got five of those and then like a five uh, tier right under that, like 10 people who are influential, big on social media and shit. And they're gonna help out five artists a piece or maybe three artists a piece, post shit. And then we just got a lot of artists booming. And naturally people are from New York are gonna say, damn, I could really live in Boston. They got some nice backyards over there, shit like that, you know what I mean? And you you got to bring it here, but it, it's gonna be on rappers getting lit. Like that's what I be wanting to see, man. I want to see rappers do numbers out here, man, because we got so much good quality, but we just not doing the fucking numbers, and it's sad. But that shit is all that matters, yo. And it's not like I don't even do the biggest numbers to get the to get. I, I just get by, you know what I mean? But everybody gotta at least get to that getting by level where at least some buildings will respect it. Cause right now our numbers aren't too respectable. It's, it's gotta be a wave. Yeah. They gotta be a wave, big wave, tsunami. I mean, that's kind of what happened when, when Stiz had glown up, right? It was like him and OG Swagger Dick and Michael Christmas. And Michael Christmas. And if you were down with that type of camp, like vintage Lee, everybody was getting a look. It has to be Stiz, how he did that. It has to be that times five at the same time people emerging you dig so let's say like five years bro and i i totally believe you can get a billboard hit because i know you like you're a psycho worker like i know you're a hustler but let's say five years would you want to come back and like build an infrastructure like that in boston or try or build a label or something like that i would definitely like to like sign you know what i mean massachusetts right now if i had a, a um if i had the right bag and and if i was all the way up and could share certain artists with the world, I would do it because there's dudes that could just go. Like, I, I I stand firm on that we have the same amount, if not more talent than any city on the East Coast easily. Really? Oh, hell yeah. I, I believe in that to my core. And any city on the East Coast means Atlanta. Atlanta's on the East Coast, right? Kinda. Kinda. We'll count it, we'll count it bro. Miami. New York, that's how I'm carrying it. But I'm looking at Mass. I don't do the Boston rap shit. Oh, yeah, hold up, hold up, because this is probably what I'll cut up as a clip. Can you decipher between Boston music and Massachusetts music, bro? Because back, way back, I'm in the Boston is under the umbrella of Massachusetts. Just, it's, Boston is the capital of Massachusetts, so it's a very important part. But 80% of the artists that's doing numbers are from cities in Massachusetts. I'm done with all of that. Yo, this is the Boston rap scene. No, the fuck it's not. No, it's not. It's not the Boston rap scene. Stop saying that shit. Unless you're from Boston, inner city Boston. You dig? It's all right to be like, yeah, we're around Boston or whatever, but people know Massachusetts too, and that's the other cop out. People would be like, yeah, you from Sudbury or whatever, and be out, out of town and go, I'm from Boston. You can say Massachusetts. Put your shit on the map. Look what. Worcester did. Worcester got the biggest artist in Massachusetts. Period. Joyner Lucas. Brockton got D to fly is 17 million views. And 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 even if you go into like culturally, like, like who came out of Lowell, who came out of um Nikki Jam is from fucking Lawrence. Like Lawrence is one of the dopest places in the world. Brockton's one of the dopest places in the world. Rocky Marciano, these towns, Cambridge. We got Patrick Ewan, Ben Affleck. Fucking Ramil Rock, we got so many talented people that come out of all these cities in mass, but the problem is people always acquainted all to Boston. And then be surprised when they go out of town and go, oh, yo, I'm from Boston. I'm gonna just say that because nobody knows Massachusetts. Yeah, that's because for the last 20 years, motherfuckers been saying, I'm from Boston. Instead of saying your town from Massachusetts, shit would have already been on the map. So I carry this. This is the Massachusetts hip hop scene. You dig? the Massachusetts hip-hop scene. This is mass hip-hop. 
So if you're from inner city Boston, then it's Boston. Other than that, miss me with all that because Boston artists don't even like hearing that anyways. They go, damn, but he's not really from Boston. And I get that. That makes sense. Massachusetts hip hop is a fresh new thing. That sounds new. Boston hip hop, the term Boston hip hop referring to the whole Massachusetts is whack. It's not going to work. It hasn't worked. Period. So you're saying like when you were really hustling in Harlem and like you were pushing tapes way back 2013, you were saying, yeah, I'm from Cambridge. If I would say I'm from the Boston area or Massachusetts around that time, I would probably say I'm from the Boston area. I'm not saying I've never jacked. I'm from Boston though. And I'm actually born in Boston and went to high school in Boston. But I you love you didn't go to range? I'm going to break it down. The first thing I say is I'm from Cambridge, where Patrick Ewan's from. Because Patrick Ewan is one of the prides of New York. So that was always an easy go-to for me. You know what I mean? I'm from where so-and-so's from. Oh, yeah, I get it. Right next to Boston. Oh, yeah, I get it. Harvard College. You heard of it? Yeah, I get it. It's not that hard to rap your shit. I was going to say, you ever run into that where you're like, yeah, I'm from Cambridge. And they're like, dude, like your hood. That's like where Harvard is. And that's where like MIT is. Yeah, but you know, people, people be confused. I was confused. I thought um, the whole Orlando was Disney World until I took a couple, you know, until I took the wrong right and the wrong left and ended up in, you know what I mean, 30 Clips Central. Like I thought Orlando was that. So it's like, you know, people got stigmas, but that's what it's up to me to to show the actual, I got like documentaries out there and shit like to show the actual, what Cambridge really was. I yeah. saw I saw the dog, bro. I loved it. I saw Phoenix down with you. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's on me, man. If you feel your city, is it known for something and make it known for something? If, if you're speaking the truth, because I'm speaking the truth, I can only give you facts. We got shot spotters too. You dig? I could only give you facts. Like, and so, yeah, I might run into that, but I'd rather take that chance than be out there. So, yeah, I'm from Boston. Nah, man, I love Massachusetts. And I think Massachusetts is dope as a whole. And this is the Massachusetts hip hop scene. You know what's wild about Cambridge is like you got the Jefferson Towers right there at Alewife. And then if you drive up the street, like two Man. miles, you're at McMansions. But that's why we got ambition though. You know what I mean? The projects is right next to MIT too. You dig like, um, that's why we have ambition because you, you're seeing all this wealth. But I, I got a line in a new song coming out. I said, um, I, I said, um, how you next to MIT living in the projects, way below, way below the poverty line, in your feelings and you out of your mind. I can't blame you. It's a weird thing, like, you know, but that's why I feel like, you know, Cambridge breeds hustlers, bro. The Cambridge hustlers keep the lights on in the downtown clubs. Ask the promoters. You know what I mean? Like we breed ambition. If you look at our city, it's 95% smaller than Boston. And we've produced at least the same amount of celebrities, at least the same amount, if not more. Probably more, oh, bro. Probably yeah, more. I know, I'm being humble. You dig, but a lot- Because then if you break up Boston by neighborhood, bro, it's like kind of spread out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really like Cambridge. Artists? It's like Cambridge, Roxbury, and some of Dorchester and this produced a lot of people. But Cambridge is really up there with the, ambitious people that made it out. I'm talking about we had the first black girl on Baywatch. Mike Jarvis, the Jarvis family, if you know about NCAA basketball. Ramil Robinson, Michael Carter Williams is really from here. You dig? Patrick Ewan, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, um, the lady from the office who's doing her own shit, the Indian lady, like, our shit. <laughs> our shit. Like she, she's not, she's from Brookline, bro. You she's from Cambridge. <laughs> I looked it up. You know Mindy Kaling? Yeah, she's from Cambridge. Look at her shit. Well, actually, well, do you count if they went to BBNN? Because BBNN got mad people there, bro. That's valid. That's Cambridge. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> Not my Cambridge, but fuck it. You get claimed too. But yeah, I think that's one of the things. The projects are next to mansions, and that gives people extra fucking ambition, yo. So, quick segue. You talk about being sped a ton. And bro, I was major sped too. I got all the extra time on the test, baby. But I wasn't, I had the ADHD bug. So like, I kind of just like couldn't sit down. Was it the same thing for you? Or were you like, couldn't read too well? It was that with, nah, 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 nah. It was that with behavior disorders. So I was sent to special education for a behavior disorder. That's what I was like. 
classified as. You get an IEP, an individual education plan, mm-hmm. when you a whole 100% spell. You dig? And that's what they gave me in sixth grade. And that's basically like a file on you, what the fuck is wrong with you, what they think your capabilities are, what they don't think your capabilities are, things like that, and how they should teach you. So I got that in sixth grade, and they put me into a little classroom with, you know, five other bad kids and shit like that. And and that's kind of how my school experience just went from there. And, and you get frustrated all the time, right? Because you're like, yo, I'm wicked smart, but like... Yeah, because I'm really nice at English, like, clearly. You dig? Um, and, um, yeah, it kind of made me... It made me feel at the time, like, all right... This is it. Because I, I was smart enough to know, all right, y'all are categorizing me as this. And this isn't good in society. I knew that. You know what I mean? I knew where I was at because I already knew the bad kids. So I'm like, why am I here with all the five bad kids? Oh, I'm a bad kid. You dig? Mm-hmm. So if I'm a bad kid, I'm going to be the baddest bad kid. You dig? Because now it's like you're competing with the other five kids in there. And that, you know, that, that cycles. And, and oh, I So you up- owned it. Yeah, because you have no other choice. It's not like you're going to learn yourself back into, or at the time I wasn't thinking like, all right, this is going to rehabilitate me back into the 30 people classes or the normal. I don't even know how many kids are in a regular class. You know what I mean? Shit like that. So I just, yeah, I just, I just owned it and, and it was what it was. Did they try to, I, I think it was the most recent Chris Webby song. You said something like, yo, they prescribed me Addies when I was a kid. They, yeah. they tried to, they tried to prescribe me when I was young too, bro. Did you take it? Of course, bro. They and then I made a film called Adderall Boy. Oh yeah. Yes, sir. It's lit. Adderall <laughs> Boy. So you've been taking it for a while. Um, no, nah, I don't take it no more. Like I'll take one every now and then, you know. But um, at that time I didn't even like taking it. Like I, I was fake taking it type shit. Fucked with your mood, right? Yeah, yeah. I felt like 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 I was dead, like a robot, like. But I would write a lot of bars, though, for real. It, it made me focus more on rap, you know? W- way less creative, though, probably. Yeah, but I, I kind of tapped into, like, when I take Adderall, it taps me into the high-level rap. Uh, maybe a little less musical, more... Uh, now, I can't even say that. It, it, Adderall helps... It, it helps me harness my creativity and, and focus it. I when just don't do- like how I feel, like, if I do it two days in a row, three days in a row, four days in a row. And then I feel like I, 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 I detox off that shit. So you're talking about the bars when you're like 12 plus 7, 8 plus B equals MC squared, those type bars. <laughs> high level, a little more high level rap than that, but yeah. So, you, so for the Sway freestyles, you were doped up? Um, it's a possi- not, not the actual freestyles, that's what I'm saying. But you know, like I'm coming up with them bars in my mind, maybe off of Addy. I can't even remember. Really, most of those bars come from like riding back and forth between Boston and, and, and New York and just thinking of shit. So is that when things really started to, like you started becoming prevalent on the internet was the Sway Freestyles? Because I remember seeing them in college, bro, and I was like, yo, this is from Cambridge, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I think that laid down the, the, that laid down the, the, the respect for me as far as like people knew I was doing music before, but I did the BT Cypher. People saw that. It was almost like 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 doing the raps and the freestyles. That was like a tool I had in my mind, but I didn't necessarily um think that I needed to use it until I use it as static once or twice. And people would be like, yo, bro, that shit is crazy. And then I realized like, oh, people really like this shit. And the more I realized people like it, I said, Oh, you haven't even seen what I could do yet. And then I just started going crazy. I did Sway, I did Goulet Kev, I did, um, I don't know, I did a lot of them. Was the Funk Flex the, the big one, the first one? Yeah, yeah, Flex was a big deal for me. Were you nervous? I was mad nervous. Like, I wasn't nervous at first, but like what happened was I went to, um, I went to uh, Hot 97, I got the call the night before. I got the call at like, at like 6 p.m. and they were like, yo, be in the studio, can, can you come to Flex tomorrow at 4 p.m. or some shit like that? And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. I, ha- I had some bars kind of ready, but I had just did Static, I think, like in the last two weeks or some shit. So every time when you're rapping for four minutes straight and you're letting all them bars off and every bar is hitting, that shit is hard work, bro. 
You know what I mean? Like there's more bars in one of my Sway freestyles than a whole album of what dudes do these days. You dig? Like four minutes of me rapping is more than a whole album bars worth of 97% of the artists that's rapping. So I, let, I just let go so much work, but I still had some, you know what I mean? And so Flex hit me, I'm like, all right, well, Flex is intern or whatever. And, and, and we got up there and I was drinking, cause I always like, before I go on stage, I always gotta drink a little. Not like get drunk, but I just need a shot for the tension or whatever. And I'm in the waiting room and he's, he's interviewing Just Blaze at the time. And they're like, yeah, it's probably gonna be like an hour. I'm like, well, all right, an hour, that, that's cool. That's acceptable, I'll get ready. And Fat Joe walks in. So now for this hour, I'm talking to Fat Joe, and this is like Fat Joe just saw me because Jada just posted me type shit. So now Joe's showing me love, and Joe's one of the illest dudes in the world. And he's showing me love, and I can't believe it. He's telling me like secrets to the game, it's different shit. And I didn't know how much energy I was draining before going and rapping type shit. So I talked with Joe for like an hour, hour and a half, then Joe goes in, and he does a two-hour interview. So now I've been at Flex for three hours in the waiting room type shit. Oh, you're, you're exhausted. And the buzz I had is already wearing off. And then Corey Guns comes in. If you know Corey Guns, he's one of the best high-level rappers ever. And I'm like, fuck, he's rapping today? So then after Joe comes out, Corey Guns goes and raps for like 20 minutes. And I'm watching him. I just uh, I peeked in the window real quick while he was rapping. And he just looked like he was going bananas. And I'm like, God damn. So at that point, I, was, I started forgetting shit I was about to say. I'm like, yo, what am I going to say? I, I was a little flustered, man. But uh, I ended up getting in there, and I choked. I choked out of all my freestyles. I never choked, but I had this line where I say, um, I had this line, and I say, uh, touch, I said, um, everyone, um, I said, that's how I go up in mass. The line was supposed to go, that's how I go up in mass. Heroin would kill him before they get the blow up in mass. Something, I'm fucking it up now. But anyways, I dropped the line and I caught it, luckily. Cause sometimes if you don't catch that line, if you ever watch battle rap, sometimes dudes will miss one line and then they gotta chalk up a whole half a round because they can't get back to, damn, what was the point I was starting at? But God willing, I caught it. And it was the, um, touching. You're talking about when you took a break, right? That's what you're talking about? Yeah, I fucked up real quick. I, 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 no, you played it off, though. I took a break. But if I didn't catch it right there, it was going to be all bad for me. You know what I mean? But I caught it, and that was the line Flex responded to in history. Do you believe in, uh, like, predetermination, like destiny? Like, when you were like really hustling, like early, early, were you always like, yo, I kind of always know I'm going to get to that point or I know where I'm going to be at? Nah, I honestly didn't. Cause like I saw, I saw a lot of death, like super young. Like my man Garrett, he died when he was like 16. Just out of nowhere type shit. No, he was 15, about to turn 16. I was 14. So that shit made me think I wouldn't really. And, and then I knew a couple other kids who died and that shit made me think like, all right, like, I'm cool if I just make it to 18 type shit. And then, you know, just seeing people pass. I don't know, I saw so much death that, like I believe in destiny, I believe in God, you know what I mean? But I couldn't say that I pictured myself, like after I turned 25, then I started looking at life like the long haul. But until 25, it was like anything goes. So at 25, when you started like in 2013, when the wheels are finally moving for you and you're like, all right, I'm gonna actually commit to this. Like, were you thinking big picture then? Like, all right, I think I'm probably going to be, like, one of the only successful artists out of my area ever. And, like, I think I'm going to get a big freestyle, and I think I'm probably going to reach a commercial level at some point. Like, you don't even picture the, that shit? Bro, I'll do anything to be successful. Like, I, every day I visualize. And I, it might work and it might not. But at least I'm fucking trying. But you put the grind to it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so it, it'll work out, like... You definitely got them, you know what I mean? You got the qualities, you got the grind, you got the mentality. I would say like, I, I, would, I set myself, I, I set my eyes on one goal at a time. You know, and I, I go after that tough and I knock those goals down. 
You dig? But I never like looked past that one. It's hard for me. You know, it's hard for me to look at like, I want a mansion in LA and I want a crib in New York. I want five cars. I want a swimming pool. I want a room where it only plays Wolf of Wall Street on loop without the, without the failure part at the end. I want certain shit. <laughs> it's hard for me to just devastating part all day. I got to go at that one goal at a time. You know what I mean? So right now it's just getting a crib. Is it all materialistic for you? Or are you like, yo, I no, 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 no. I saw them. I'm saying that's, that's like, that's like, like end goal financially type shit. But how I get there is I look at the goal right in front of it. All right, this is what I got to do. I got to, um, you know, whatever that goal might be at the time. Like in, in 2013, I set my eyes on the BET Cypher. I went three years because I knew a cameraman at the BET Cypher who would kind of let me in the back door type shit. And he would say like, yo, if an artist doesn't show up, maybe you could rap. And I went three years in a row. I was there when Kendrick and them was there. I was there, I was there for all of that shit. And then 2016, I finally knocked that goal down. And somebody didn't show up. And I was able to go rap and, and, and I started off the BET Awards, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, I'll hone in on one goal instead of like mad goals at one time, which I wish I could hone in on mad goals at one time. What is it right now for you? Um, I want, I want a, a situation where I can, I can, uh, I can be financially comfortable with with my buzz going up while I have time to record in the way that I want to record an album. That's all I want. Don't you not want to be comfortable? Like I comfort I just mean scares comfortable, me, bro. Comfortable, yeah, comfortability is trash. I'm talking about comfortable enough for the process of doing this album because I want to go out to Columbia for a month and make an album. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, where, like, I still got the the budget for everything going on back home, shit like that. It just be, um, you know, things like that. I want I want a real marketing budget. I I just want my shot, man. I want I want my real shot at putting my face in front of the public. You know, at the highest platform it could be. That's pretty much my goal. But yeah, nah. To to your point of comfortability, yeah, comfortability definitely scares me because I'm we're from a state where a lot of people are way too complacent anyway. How do you know when you're being too comfortable? I think you don't get those butterflies. You don't get scared about shit that's about to go on. You know. I feel you. Hey, uh, slugs, B and Lexi. Who wants to start? With, actually, B. We'll start with you. You got a question for Millie's? Yeah, I got a question. So I'm wondering when you when you're first starting off rapping, you know, like a lot of rappers kind of wear their influences on their sleeves, and they kind of you know develop their own their own way. And I'm wondering who were your biggest influences, and then what was the point where you you found like you had your own voice? Hmm. Um. Probably like Prodigy from Mob Deep was a big influence of mine. Like I liked. I liked Eminem and I liked Biggie. I loved them, I should say, and Big Pun and all these dudes and Nas, but they felt so advanced music-wise to, to me. Like the shit that they were saying was so, it sounded so crazy to me and so super intellectual. And, you know, I'm, I'm young and I started listening to Prodigy from Wild Deep and he was kind of saying what they were saying, but in a way more simplistic way. And I was like, all right, I could probably do what he's doing. And what he was doing was amazing too. So I would say I probably patterned my style. Like when I first started rapping, I completely sounded like Prodigy from Wild Deep, a way deeper voice, <laughs> just how he was having <laughs> flow patterns. But eventually I, I found myself where I think I, I took, I, I went back and took a mixture of all the artists that I, that I grew up listening to. It's a blessing, bro. Cause you don't really sound like anybody else right now. Yeah. I love that shit. And, and I could switch my style to a lot, like a lot of the dudes who can do high level rap, they can't do melody rap. 
you know, they can't, um, or the dudes who can do melody rap, they can never go to flex ever. And so, bro, a lot of rappers right now don't watch CNN either, bro. And I know you you tune in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Politics, well, all them channels are weird now. It, bro, all it's... Political channels are super weird. I, I'm getting tired of just everybody pushing an agenda on any side of anything. You know what I mean? It's like, man, I want some news. Yeah, you turn on the TV now if you want to get in a bad mood, bro. That's pretty yeah, much it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Lexi, you got one from Millie's? Yeah, Millie's. Hi. So you're a pretty smart dude, and I do follow you on Twitter. <laughs> you. And recently you tweeted, um, this was back in April, that you think that the Democratic Party should have ran Andrew Cuomo as the presidential nominee <laughs> instead of Joe Biden. Could you talk about that a little bit? Le- Le- Lexi, uh, Lexi's going to be, she's going to run CNN one day. So she's part right. Make sure you bring me on for interviews. <laughs> um, I don't know shit about politics for real. Like, I do, <laughs> I do, but I don't. You know what I mean? I just, I believe that it's so simplistic as just like run a person that people like. You know what I mean? Like, just run somebody who people like. And Andrew Cuomo seemed like people was liking him around the time <laughs> that he was making them speeches. I saw him speaking. I was like, you could be president. The bar is pretty low to be president now. So, you know. Without Andrew Cuomo, I really just want somebody to um, cause Trump is funny as shit and he's <laughs> an asshole. Like, you see this paper flick? Nah, you ever seen him flick the papers? Like, <laughs> nah, he's hilarious. But um, we need somebody to, we need somebody that that is cause Trump, he's like a fake alpha male. You know what I mean? He needs like a real alpha male to go in there and out alpha him. Like, that's how I look at shit in my mind. I don't know, like. I just feel like if you come in there and you're like a beta, he's going to chew you up. You got to really go toe-to-toe with him. You got to eat through him. I agree, bro. That dude Cuomo is like, damn, this dude's like a perfect politician, man. He speaks well. Yeah, and he's a man's man, so I think he could he could go he could go get it done. But the fuck do I know, man? I feel you. Hey, uh, Slugs, you got a question? Yeah, I do. Um, Let's go, Slugs. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to talking about Cambridge and like the wealth disparity in that city, what part of your upbringing or life do you think uh, motivates and inspires you when you write your music? Slugs, that was a terrible question. <laughs> I'm messing with you, Slugs. That was great. What part of my my life and my upbringing motivates me to write my music? Is the question? Yeah. Um, I think she's asking how how do you pull from growing up in Cambridge and bro, put just, into the music? It's just, just everything because like I, I lived an extreme lifestyle in Cambridge, extreme since I was young. Like I like it was very accessible in my neighborhood to sell drugs. I started selling drugs at 12 years old. You know what I mean? And I started selling hard drugs at 14 years old in Central Square, around there, like you know, like I, I've seen a lot. We've been in t- state police car chases. You know, if you look at my cases, much by the time I was 19, I was charged with armed robbery, goddamn um, uh, conspiracy to traffic cocaine, another charge of um, cocaine trafficking. Like, my life was going so fast, like, all in Cambridge. I, I got shit to, I, if I wanted to go to that well and keep getting water out of that well forever, I could do it. But other than that, I just saw, uh, like, Cambridge is also, like, a creative place. So, I, you know, I, I pull my creation. I guess it's just such a hip-hop city, you know? But, like, yeah, my, my life, I don't even think that it's, like, for just from being from Cambridge where I pull from. It's, like, just how I was living, you know what I mean? I think that's wicked interesting that you were – that you were selling drugs in Central back then because Central's changed so much. I mean, obviously, it's still bad and there's still a lot of homeless people, but, dude, Cambridge is so different. Shifted a ton. You know what we got to do? We got to do a panel with you and Sumble Siddiqui, the mayor. You guys are probably close in age. We'll do Millie's in the mayor. That'd be hilarious. All uh, right. I'm with it. Um, okay, man. Well, hey, dude. I had a great time. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, man. Thank y'all. I keep going. Podcast is great. I like your ambition, your hustle. Salute to the whole team. You know what We got two bits at the end to end the show. And shout out to John Scott. I haven't seen you guys in a while. I hope the studio's open, man. My boy. They're supposed to open up another spot. Whoa, or something, right? I don't know. They don't tell me nothing. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, my fault, bro. So they have, we have two bits. First bit is called GDP sales mode. So I'm going to give you, and you're a salesman, bro. You know how this works. I'm going to give you 40 seconds, the floor, to sell whatever you got coming up, like album, single, show, whatever it is. But you can go real sales or you can go a little more slick back with your approach. I'm going to count down on my, my phone and I'll tell you when. I'll give you a five second countdown. All right. Five, four, three, two, one, bang. I got the hottest music coming out of the East Coast. I'm the only artist that does high level rap slash melodic rap on every project. I give you my life. In January, my monthly listeners on Spotify were at 33,000. Now they're at 300,000, some change. Get with the movement, man. Get with the wave. You dig? It's my pitch, man. Nice. That was effective. Let's go. Damn, you really, 10, 10 times your number's up in five months? That's crazy. Is that 10 times? You said 30,000 to 300K, I was right? at 33,000, and now I'm at 320,000, whatever what, that is. What was the big bump? Um, I started focusing on Spotify. Before, I would just drop like a project, but then my man, my man China Max, salute to him, he came to me and he was like, yo, bro, your monthly listeners are terrible for who you are. Like, you should... You got to focus on this shit like you focus on Instagram. And I said, for real? Like, you think my shit is whack? He's like, yeah, it's just whack for who you are, bro. Like, it was like drop shit. And I started dropping a single. I dropped um, I dropped Crawfish, Freestyle. I dropped uh, Great Poupon with Mercules and Chris Webby. I dropped Atlantis. Uh, Atlantis with Sosa Geek. I dropped RLS that's booming. I dropped The Muscle. Um, and then I just dropped another song with Chris Webby, and, but it's like them singles. It's like the listeners were always there. I just had to drop shit, you know? So that's how it works. You got to drop consistently on Spotify. It's not one project. For me, but I got the buzz of those songs going up. You know what I mean? But yeah, definitely, I think you got to drop consistently, consistently. It's like, it's kind of like Instagram. I learned that shit. And so now, you know, we off to the races. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Hey, that's how we start and end the show. You say, hi, your name and this is my golden hour. So hi, I'm Millie's, this is my golden hour. Directly after No Break High, your name, and that was my golden hour. And bro, thank you for doing this, man. Out of blast. Hey, explain that again. This is back to special education. What do I, I gotta got do? you, bro. From one sped boy to another dog. Hi, I'm blank, ah, Millie's, me. and this is my golden hour. Directly after No Break High, I'm Millie's, and that was my golden hour. All right, I got you. Whenever you're ready, bro. Hi, my name is Millie's, and this is my golden hour. Hi, my name is Millie's, and that was my golden hour. Freeze and fire.